Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Williamson County School Board for the November 18th edition. Uh, first thing is, board members, if you would record your attendance, please. And we have Ms. Durham, who is going to be uh, uh, working in the meeting tonight remotely. And she's going to supposed to pop up her picture on this computer up here for me. And then, uh, Angela, can you hear us? Hear you. Okay, so uh, we need to record, and, and Tim McNeese is going to record your votes as you say them. So you are in attendance, correct? Attendance. Okay. Go ahead then, Tim, push the... Okay. Brian, if you'd record our attendance. All right, 100% present. Thank you. Next item is our Pledge of Allegiance and Moment of Silence. If everyone would please rise as we have Deputy Matt Erickson lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda is the uh, cons uh, discussions of people who want to speak to the board, our public interest section, public comment. First person up. We have five this evening, so we'll go with three minutes for each person. If you'd state your name, address, and your subject is Daniela Kuntz. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniela Kuntz. I live at 132 Cavalry Drive, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. I just wanted to let you know that I and uh, the American Lung Association, uh, the executive director, did meet with uh, Superintendent Golden on November 12th. And we um, extensively talked. And it was a great meeting, I think. <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, hand out the, uh, some of the things that I also gave to Superintendent Golden. That's all. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker or speakers is Mark King and Wendy Lukin. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Caleb Bone, and he's with us. So he's going to go first if that's okay. Okay. So my name is Caleb Bone. I'm with the American Heart Association. Um, we were actually here this evening in partnership with Williamson Medical Center. I have Mark King and Wendy uh, with us here this evening uh, to present some CPR and schools kits to Nolensville High School. Um, so with the American Heart Association, an area of focus for us is um, making a change in CPR training and readiness for Tennessee residents. Uh, the Greater Nashville American Heart Association provides CPR certification for local EMS and through community programs and uh, also provides hands-only CPR training through our corporate partners and um, through schools as well. So in 2012, Tennessee passed the Can Carmen Burnett Act, which requires students to have hands-only CPR training uh, for graduation. And so as part of that act, we put together some programs which allowed us um, to help provide some of the kits that go towards that training as well. Um, designed specifically for in-school training, the CPR in schools training kit provides high school students with the opportunity to learn the life-saving skills to act in cardiac emergency. The American Heart Association is proud to work in collaboration with Williamson Medical Center on this initiative. Williamson Medical Center has been a supporter of our CPR in schools uh, program for several years, and we're excited to continue working alongside them to support local schools with the resources necessary to learn this life-saving skill. So I'll turn it over to Mark. 
Good evening. My name is Mark King. I'm here representing Williamson Medical Center. We're excited to be here again. You might remember I was here, I think it was last year, doing a similar program for a different school, and this is, I think, the third time that we've done this. And so we're honored to uh, provide assistance with the Heart American Heart Association and extend this mission into uh, Nolensville High School. Uh, we will be supplying the uh, CPR and school kits to Nolensville High that will help their students and their uh, faculty teach the students their CPR. By placing these kits in Nolensville High School, we're helping to create more lifesavers and people that are prepared to meet uh, the need in time of an emergency. Schools are an excellent location to teach CPR. Students are a captive audience and they also uh, learn skills that they will carry with them for the rest of their life. And so whether they maintain the certification or not, we hope they do, but if they don't, they'll still have the skills needed. But a lot of times we, uh, we know that around 42,000 people suffer cardiac arrest each year outside of a hospital. And about 90% of those people will pass away for a couple of reasons. One, people are not trained or they're afraid to act. And so we want to provide them the life-saving skills that they'll be able to render aid at that time of need. We know that by meeting that need in, in that time, they can double or triple their survival rate. And so Williamson Medical Center is proud to partner with American Heart Association on this initiative and proud to provide these kits to uh, the Nolensville High School. Thank you. Well, thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Very good. Okay, is Dr. Harlan. I think Would it be okay if we grab a picture with him? Absolutely. Sure. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Michael Brown. Hi, my name is Michael Brown, and I'm from Franklin High School, located on 810 Hillsborough Road, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. So like I said, um, my name is Michael Brown, and I'm the student body president of Franklin High School. I'm here representing the student body presidents of all the high schools in Williamson County and to let you know kind of what we've been up to. Since July 6th, we've been meeting periodically to unite Williamson County Schools and work towards a bright future for all of us here and those working on homework at home or at jobs, whatever it may be. An example of what we've been up to is we've had shadow days, as we've called them, where presidents switched schools for a day where um, I took the Brentwood student body president and showed them around Franklin, showed them how I run my school and I will be going to a school later in the year to see how they run and how I can better run the school that I've been elected to lead. We've had the honor of meeting with Mr. Golden and Ms. Webb monthly to discuss current events and give a voice on future endeavors and have discussed several ideas on how to produce a positive change for Williamson County, one of which will be brought up later. Our main goal is to create a brighter future for tomorrow by working with each other, not against each other. One way we see ourselves working together in the future and propose for the school board to contemplate is the potential of having a non-voting school student seat on the school board to give the student body a voice and representation <coughs> on topics that affect us each and every day. Though many changes may not occur during my or my predecessor's time, I, along with the other presidents, hope to set a precedent for a cooperative and better future for Williamson County teachers, staff, and students. Thank you for all that you do, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Avery Smith. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Um, I go to Page High School at Arno Road. Um, so I'm here to discuss with you the Williamson County High School Green Initiative. The initiative will take place during the week of February 24th through 28th. 
Our ultimate goal with this Green Week is to inspire positive change in our district as well as introduce new habits to the students. The week will be comprised of a daily environmental theme, informational video, behavioral challenges, and thought-provoking activities. We also plan to reach outside of just students and into the community through a green fair, which will end the week on an inclusive and educational note. A large part of our green proposal includes a pilot week for biodegradable trays and just water bottles. The point of the biodegradable trays is to be able to compost the trays instead of sending them to landfills. We have communicated with two separate compost companies to gather more information about their processes and collection services. The largest problem we've encountered is the price. For one school in one week, the compost service is about $300 to $500. We have been in contact with Mr. Rometty, the food services director, about specifics and will be conducting fundraisers to cover whatever costs may be needed for that week. Though this may be a pilot week, our hope is to extend it to a year-long endeavor. When we are looking at long-term implementation, that price is not feasible. Because both of the compost companies' operations are in Nashville, we propose a compost facility in or near Franklin that can be used by the schools as well as community members. The compost facility has a lot of potential to create business in our area, especially because business, current business that compost near Franklin, for example, the grilled cheesery, use these Nashville operations. But if we had a closer location for compost, it would be more efficient for these businesses and for the school system. So what we are proposing is for the board to investigate the feasibility of a compost compost facility in the Franklin area for Williamson County use. We understand that the timing of our proposal may not coincide with current plans. However, we hope that by bringing this to your attention, we can work together to help the future of Williamson County and our environment. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of our speakers for this evening. Um, the next item is Addendum to correct a clerical error in superintendent of schools contract. Ms. Allsbrooks, if you could explain to the board about this uh, clerical error, please. Sure. Addendum number one in paragraph 15 of the contract for Superintendent Golden, there was a clerical error as to the date in that paragraph, and this addendum will correct that date. Okay, so we're looking for a motion on this correction. I'd like to make a motion. Motion from Ms. Garrett. Anyone like to second it? Second. We, we, and we have a second for Mr. Fiscus. Any discussion? I'm not going to ask for your uh, recommendation on I this. I recommend approval. Oh, I figured you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on this one? Okay, I, I see none. Board members, if you go ahead and record your votes, and then let me ask Ms. Durham, how would you like to vote on this? I vote yes. Yes. And Tim, if you'd record her vote. All right. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you, board. Next item is the approval of the agenda. We have a motion for the approval of our, of our agenda for this evening. We have a motion from Mr. Cash. I'd like to second that motion. We have a second from Mr. Hall. Any further discussion? Okay, I see none. If you go ahead and record your votes on the agenda. Ms. Durham? Yes. Thank you. Okay, votes are locked. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. All right. Next item is approval of the consent agenda. I would like to make a motion for approving the consent agenda items. Okay, we have, we have a motion from Ms. Cleveland. Anyone like to second that? We have a second for Mr. Mitchell. Any further discussion on the consent agenda items? Okay, I see none. And if you go ahead and record your votes, please. Ms. Durham? I vote yes. Okay. Votes are locked. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. All right, with that approval of the consent agenda, the board approved the school board meeting minutes. We approved the board policies on second reading, and there are a lot of them. Uh, we approved policies for deletion. There are a lot of them as well. And we approved the recommendation for the field trip fee requests. We approved the LEA compliance report. We approved the textbook adoption committee. We approved the Town of Thompson Station Sign Ordinance Independence High School Lighted Sign Request to Implement County Powers Act, and we approved the Page High School Batting Cage Enclosure. 
The next item is communications to the board. We have the superintendent's report. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, we've been going through a really good school year. I've been very proud of and excited for both our uh, administration uh, and our teachers and really especially for our students and the work they're doing. You all heard a little bit from a couple of our students uh, just, just uh, recently in public comment and I have been just doubly impressed with them. Uh, with the work that we've been doing these last few months as the school year started. It is a great group of leaders in, a, in our student body, and it's been a joy for me to spend some time talking with them. You heard them talk about some of their plans, both specific as to environmental issues and also long-term, and I look forward to us having some further discussions about that. I uh, did want to also mention to you that the middle school orchestra from Grassland Middle School performed and it struck me again what I mentioned to many of you a few days ago, which is the growth of our um, arts programs, both the band and the orchestra theater. In addition to that, over the course of these last few years, uh, has, they've really grown. And I've concluded that one of the big reasons is because about 10 years ago, you as a board made a commitment to start putting performing arts centers in all our schools, both at the middle school and at the high school level. We've now reached a point that uh, Mr. Adelet, David Adelet, uh, is doing some research on our school facilities at the high school level, evaluating the extent to which we can actually look to increase the size of band rooms because our participation rate has grown so much. Our high school programs really depend on those middle school programs for growth, and I'm really very proud of our middle schools for that. I often don't talk about the, uh, the, the public comment, but I did want to mention, since Ms. Kuntz mentioned our meeting with the American Lung Association Tennessee president, we spent some time talking about vaping. Uh, we've all, we spent some time at some of our public meetings talking about that, and one of the things that was emphasized to me is that there's a lot of work being done nationally on the vaping, uh, on, on, the, on vaping issues, not just related to uh, adults, but also to students, and I look forward to getting some more information from the American Lung Association, the Tennessee chapter, related to that. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, when it comes to vaping and educating our students on the risk associated with that, not just with the drugs uh, that are illegal for our students to, to use, but also the health effects of, uh, of that process. Did want to mention to you finally that uh, we will be out of the office next week. Schools will be closed because of the Thanksgiving holidays. That's a, that's a week out. So that is, this is actually the, going to be the first time that the central office is going to be closed all week based upon some calendar decisions that were made last year. So I felt like it was important to emphasize that to you. Like always, I'll have on my email, I am out of the office and check my emails periodically. I can't resist, but I got to tell you, I'm encouraging everybody to take some time off. Uh, we've been going at it hard. And, and there's a whole lot of value in that that needs to happen, but um, also from a break perspective, I'm looking forward to our students and faculty having a break. I know there are a lot of assessments through the end of this week, and so we are very encouraged about where our students are. And Mr. Chair, the next item on the agenda is the student spotlight. So uh, I want to introduce Carol Birdsong. to start tonight with perfect ACT scores. We have about half of the, the students that we're going to honor from this last testing period tonight, and we will do the remainder of those students next, uh, actually not next month because we won't be here, but in January. So if I could ask Dr. Jones, please, to come forward, and then Alex Bush, if you will come on. This is Alex Bush from Fairview High School. Perfect ACT composite. Correct me if I'm wrong, but first, first one at Fairview, right? First one, in Fairview. First one at Fairview. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Now, Dr. Pantoff, I can ask you to come up. Okay, Karsten Rovey. Karsten, come on up. Okay. 
Karsten also scored a perfect ACT composite score at the September testing period. Smile for the cameras, please. We want to make sure this moment's captured. <laughs> Dr. Vaden, if you'll come up. All right, Ian Brown, come on up here, Ian. Ian also scored a perfect ACT composite score during the September test. All right, Ian, if you will just stand over here, we'll do a brief 15 minutes since we've got a couple. We have two uh, Ravenwood students who couldn't be with us, so we're skipping through there really fast. Okay, and then if I can have Trisha Momzadar come on up. Come on up, Trisha. Also from Ravenwood High School, perfect ACT composite score. Okay, let's get your photo made. Now, if I can get Ravenwood together for you guys to stand together, Dr. Vaden, and if y'all want a picture of the whole Ravenwood crew. <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. <laughs> Dr. Lamb. Dr. Lamb with Summit High School and Noah Bell. Come on up. Noah also scored a perfect ACT composite in the September testing. <laughs> Congratulations to all of you. Now we're moving on. This is actually a Brentwood High graduate, but we get this information late you know, on into the next year. This is Namra Ajmal, and Namra is one of only two AP State Scholars, uh, and she is the, the female scholar for the state of Tennessee. Let's go to athletics, Fairview High School, Alyssa's, Alyssa, Andrea, Andrea, and okay. All right, our, our state cross country champion, Division I small school. Her coaches are Chris Smith and Trent Walker. And on to soccer, TSSAA Soccer State Champs, Ravenwood High School in 3A. And I'm going to attempt to read off all of these names really quickly. Ashley uh, Yoshihara, Leah Johnson, Mia Frazier, Sarah Cloud, Sarah Kate Rath, Courtney Hill, Josie Ricketts, Aaron Bentley, Anna Major, Tori Case, Marcelo Ferrero Preto, Lily Perez, Nora Henderson, Christina Stouffer, Lauren Hyatt, Maddie Gleason, Anna J, Lorelai De La Quista, Faith Vanson, and Kendall Curran and their coaches are head coach Brandon Mead, assistant coaches Jessica Mancini and Megan Nugent. Also, we're moving to volleyball. I know this seems like it happened forever and a day ago, but we are just now honoring our volleyball champions. And in 3A, it was Brentwood High School. Team members include Reese Bailey, Haley Carpenter, Zoe Oldham, Mary Oldham, Holly Tate, Riley Kale, Shay Eggleston, Anna Sellers, Dylan Sulser, Ashley Miller, Haley Corinne Frist, Sophie Frolic, Haley Sanders, Piper Drasick, Meredith Moody, Presley Dowdy, Carol Thacker, Jesse Sellers, Sophie Cummins, Sydney Seifert, and Gracie Young, coaches. Head coach Barbara Campbell, assistant coaches Kathy Cram and Angie Noble. But guess what? Nolensville High School also won a volleyball state champion in 2A. Team members Caroline Johnston, Charlie Fulton, Lauren Starkey, Avery Patton, Natalie Donahue, Mamie Guthrie, Ellie Tant, Jasmine Jenkins, Cayman Ladd, Maggie Rickard, Sydney Blodern, Lords Doyle, Avery Young, Madeline McKinley, McNeely, and Anna Barrera. Coaches, head coach Brent Young, assistant coaches Joy Wino, and Jennifer Childs. Now we're going on to the arts. And these are your all-state chorus members from Brentwood High School. 
Alex Cook, Caroline Conti, Viva Hurst, Ella Saliba, Caleb Oakley, Michelle Q, and Macy Wade. Natalie Pratt is their choral director from Centennial High School. Graham, Catterick, Chris Cooper, Sydney Hoover, Austin Krill, Addie Lewis, and Natalie Peter Lopez. Jonathan Vest, their choral director from Franklin High School. Molly Pope, Molly Volker, Lillian Brown, Lily Warren, and Aisha Henshaw. Angela Beal is their choral director from Independence High School. Hayden DeWestblair, Aaron Weaver, Carson Hamil Hamlin, Preston Rogers, Evelyn Pomillon, Jessica Coffey, and Grace Riley, Justin Kirby is their choral director. From Ravenwood High School, Mark Devodlik, Ben Jessup, Trisha Mazumdar, Cameron Rasmussen, Aiden Schacht, Madeline Thomas, and Jasper Velasquez. Ethan Bennett, choral director from Summit High School. Maddie Bauer, Logan Bitten, Bra Braden Fitzgerald, Jack Glenn, Ava Porowitz, Kelsey Tardiff, and Megan Robinson, Jenna Ellsbury, their choral director. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Huh. Staff Spotlight. Heather McHugh, Brentwood High School. Heather was named the Tennessee Art Educator Association Secondary Art Educator of the Year. And last but certainly not least, may I have Mr. Golden and Miss Goodwin please come forward. And if I could have representatives from Crockett Elementary School to come to the front, please under the leadership of Principal Bronwyn Rector. If you all missed it, I believe it was, you just got back, didn't you? Right, uh, on Friday night, okay. They just received, uh, they were just named the 2019 Blue Ribbons. Get up, step up here and show, turn it around, show the board. <laughs> look at that, look at that pretty, yeah. Very nice, very nice. They were named a Blue Ribbon School for us, and Mr. Golden also has another uh, plaque for you to, to take back to school as well, as a thank you to celebrate your accomplishments. Yes, they do. So, um, if y'all can figure out the best way to. That wouldn't be awkward. You sure? Everybody look. Did you, you got it? Okay. Very good. Congratulations. And that concludes our student and staff spotlights for the evening. Congratulations to all of our students and to our staff members. Mr. Chair, as we conclude uh, the superintendent's report and the district updates, I do want to say that it feels like we are the All-State Choir here at WCS. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, board members on the board chairman's report, I uh, wanted to make everyone aware that we do not have any scheduled board meetings for December. And that is to give Ms. Birdsong a chance to practice her snow calls at home. <laughs> I've had a lot of requests for her to practice that and use it yes. a lot this year. So, uh, But also with that at your place tonight is a list of all of the uh, activities going on in December at our schools, all the fine arts, all the school programs for the holidays. And it's, as you can see, it's quite an extensive list for, that our schools are putting on. And that's one of the reasons that we... Uh, try to take December off so we can go and enjoy our schools and our students. Uh, next thing is I, I have to ask Mr. Rick Wimberly. He attended the TSBA Legislative Conference and he has been involved with TSBA on their board. And so Mr. Wimberly, could you please share with us, uh, the folks at home and, and the board, 
what kind of legislative action did TSBA take at their uh, at their conference? Well, we were uh, there were I think five of us at the uh, convention um, uh, delegation gathering where we were presented with quite a handful of resolutions to vote on, uh, most of which uh, dealt with the uh, legislation or with legislation. And if you'll allow me for just a moment, I'll zip through those pretty quickly. A uh, uh, resolution was passed that said that uh, TSBA believes that local boards of education are the best equipped and informed to make decisions to address the needs and challenges of their local schools and that TSBA is, as a practice would oppose any efforts to uh, diminish uh, local control. Uh, the association also passed a resolution that would oppose any legislation or similar effort to create or expand programs in Tennessee that would divert money uh, intended for public schools to uh, private schools or organizations. Uh, the uh, association passed a resolution urging the General Assembly to provide an increase in the instructional salary component of the BEP equivalent to the amount of money that would be spent on the education savings account voucher program uh, each year. Um, there was a resolution passed that urges the General Assembly to amend the law that um, permits a waiver of class size to, to help create funding for the school districts who have their own grow your own teacher innovations. And we heard um, a good bit about um, one of the districts in particular, and that's uh, Clarksville, Montgomery County, in a partnership with Austin P. Uh, in an initiative to, um, to, as it says, grow their own educators. And we all know we're headed toward a teacher shortage if we don't already have one. So this was pretty interesting to hear about, and TSBA uh, supports it. There was a resolution passed that um, urged the General Assembly to change, actually reduce the state academic assessment plan uh, and uh, and it specified a number of uh, uh, assessments, state mandated assessments for subject and class area. Uh, it urged the uh, General Assembly to uh, require that any private education institution that receives funds through the education savings account program uh, be held uh, responsible to the same type of testing that uh, the public schools are held to. Um, there was a uh, resolution passed that urged the General Assembly to mandate that the Department of Education develop a formative assessment question bank that's aligned with the state standards. Uh, it's my understanding that there has been talk over a number of years and some efforts uh, to do this, but it has never actually happened uh, to the extent that's uh, helpful to all the school districts, so this would uh, pass a law that would require that. Uh, there was a resolution passed uh, that would urge the General Assembly, the State Board of Education, to create alternative pathways for uh, teachers to uh, be able to attain licenses. I know we have talked about that on our board where there were some restrictions uh, and certain things that um, uh, we felt uh, stood in the way of us hiring some, some good teachers, so that uh, hopefully will be addressed. Uh, there was a resolution asking for changes to student discipline law, I think this as much as anything was to uh, clarify some ambiguity. And uh, the final one uh, urged the General Assembly to ask or to require the Department of Education to, to make sure that there was meaningful consultation with stakeholders like ourselves um, prior to making any changes in the accountability model uh, to the State Board of Education. So um, we had a couple of resolutions that were considered. One uh, was withdrawn that probably would have hurt us financially. So we were kind of glad to see that, um, that happen. Uh, there were, if I counted correctly, five of us from our board who attended the delegate assembly. Um, 
and we had some meaningful uh, conversation about um, uh, some of these things. So um, I'd also like to add that, you know, this is a four day event. This is the first time I've been there for all four days. And I was just kind of amazed at the end of it, at the amount of um, information that was available to those who attended. Uh, there was uh, some significant innovation coming from um, various school districts, large ones, small ones. Um, they had breakout sessions, I think, on Saturday. And those of us who were there, we kind of divided and conquered and went to different sessions so that we could um, uh, develop insight on some of the things that we as a board have been talking about. That was good. Uh, there was some good fellowship. And in fact, I'll have to say that uh, we had a little break in the activity on Saturday. And I was with some of our fellow um, uh, state board members and uh, invited uh, uh, Brad and Candy to join. And they, they made a point afterwards to say how much they enjoyed the two of you. So there was a good bit of fellowship with other um, board members across the state and quite honestly, you know, amongst us as well. It, it was a good time. And there, were, there was quite a bit of inspiration. Um, the, um, the inspirational speakers were outstanding. One of the people we heard from was a fellow named Manny Scott. And um, Mr. Soon-to-be Dr. Scott um, is one of the students who was featured in that movie uh, called The Freedom Riders that Hillary Swank did. And if you'll remember, this was a, a disadvantaged school district. Um, and it was the story of how uh, a, a white collar wealthy teacher uh, figured out how to communicate with these young students and uh, got a lot of success. And it was kind of more than a presentation. It was a performance. He even threw a chair at one point. And uh, I think he had the, um, the, um, the whole crowd uh, in tears and, and one of the things that I personally was, was thankful for is he related it to the Board of Education. While we may not be dealing directly uh, with students, uh, he did talk about how we as board members can have an impact on, on students like that and by doing the things that we do to support uh, the front lines and our teachers. And that wasn't the only uh, inspiration, was it, Ms. No, Anderson? We, we had some inspiration quite a bit actually from Franklin High School students that came and visited uh, us and gave us a, our own kind of the whole group a concert that was just I, it's it's hard it was magnificent it was uh, there were flutes it, there was percussion and uh, the students were aligned all over this huge ballroom so they were and you come in and you sit down and you hear like a little kind of a tweeter or, or twit you know like birds singing and it's echoed over here with a different flute that is playing something and it bounced around ping ponged all around the room and then it got very quiet like it would in the morning when the birds are kind of calming down and the percussion started up again and it was just inspiring and to see our kids up there like you know young masters doing something that was just so beautiful i was so proud for franklin high school and they are doing a great job i think mr golden enjoyed it as well really you know i have to say that um i i really enjoyed uh the year that i spent on this board and and, and having an up close uh look at it and in fact the year passed uh, quite quickly, uh, and I don't ever recall um, getting off of a board before I wanted to get off of one, quite <laughs> honestly. Um, but um, I encourage all of you to get involved at TSBA and to uh, take advantage of the offerings and the uh, what we learn from the other districts and represent us well. I will tell you, us having not been a member for a number of years, uh, we, uh, at every turn, were made to feel welcome by, I think, by everyone. So, thank you. Is that enough, Mr. Anderson? Yes, sir. Did you bring the school bell? No, I don't think you understood what I was talking about when I told you they gave me a bell 
this bell is huge. <laughs> and uh, if, if I rang it, uh, we'd be blowing out microphones. So maybe some other time. But uh, okay. they did give me a real nice school bell as a board member. I told them, I said, this is one of the best boards I've ever been kicked off of. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ms. Garrett, you would like to uh, say something about recent activities at our schools? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Anderson. I just wanted to say thank you to all of the schools who took the time and um, went to great effort to honor our local veterans on Veterans Day. Um, I, I noticed... Uh, from from social media that so many different schools were participating in so many different ways some of our schools marched in the parade and participated in the parade other schools uh, like the school I attended at uh, I attended the ceremony at Page High uh, and they brought in an alum who is a veteran who who spoke uh, they brought in the two local American Legion posts and relatives of students there who were veterans and I won't soon forget being able to see the faces of uh, men and women who have served our country um, saying the pledge, knowing, knowing every bit of the etiquette and the decorum and respect that goes along with that, and taking in our students experiencing that as well. Um, these, these, we are in school on Veterans Day. And it was clear to me that our schools create some very impactful experiences for our children on those days. So I want to express my appreciation to all the schools. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. I know there's a lot of activities that go on in those schools to honor our, our veterans. All right. Next item is, I'm sorry, Dan. I'm sorry I missed you on the thing here, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to piggyback what Nancy said. Uh, I know at Bethesda Elementary they had a, a recruiter there that uh, went in and spoke to the kids in Thompson Station uh, Middle School, did a fantastic job honoring the veterans. We had a, about a 94 or 95-year-old World War II veteran telling his story, and you could have heard a pin drop. And these kids, the band and everything, it's just, it's where they need to be on Veterans Day. And as a vet, I, I feel so comfortable with that. I know some people feel we need to have off, but we got, we got the word out to so many students in our classrooms, and that's where it should be. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we don't have any un finished business so we move on to new business and the first item is human trafficking professional development plan mr. golden uh, thank you mr. chair uh, there's a state law that just was passed last year that requires the board to approve our human trafficking professional development plan we presented that to you in the board agenda so staff recommends approval of that plan yeah, I would like to make a motion for this we have a motion from Ms. Emerson and a second from Ms. Cleveland any further discussion on this? Okay, I see none. If you then go ahead and record your votes. And Ms. Durham, and by the way, I can see Ms. Durham on the TV monitor. Jason, you can see Ms. Durham. Yes, she's here. So if you go ahead and, and tell us your vote. I vote yes. She's not eating. She's not eating. Oh, oh was somebody eating when we did this once before? <laughs> Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you. The next item is the 2019-2020 school board budget. Uh, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first item on there is the school board budget resolution for buses. This is the time of year where we ask the board to fund replacement buses out of our fund balance. If you have any questions, uh, Ms. Holman may be able to answer them in addition to me. Staff recommends approval. Anyone like to make a motion on this? We have a motion from Mr. Fiscus. Anyone like to second it? We have a second from Mr. Cash. Any further questions, discussions, comments? OK, 
Okay, I see none. You have the superintendent's recommendation. Go ahead and record your votes. Ms. Durham? I vote yes. Thank you. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Okay, the next, the next item under the budget is general purpose school budget resolution intercategory transfer for 2019-2020 salary. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the time of the year where Leslie Holman's office takes the raises that and, uh, and classified uh, pay uh, increases from one particular budget line item into all the appropriate budget line items. This is an inter-category transfer and staff recommends approval. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to make a motion on this one. We have, we have a motion from Mr. Wimberly and I'd like to second it. We have a second from Mr. Hall. Any further discussions, comments? Okay, I see none. Go ahead and record your votes. Ms. Sturm? I vote yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you, board. The third one is general purpose school budget resolution for new school startup costs. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, it feels like almost every time this year we take this to you, every time a school opens, we do uh, for the startup cost to prepare for the middle school that is scheduled to open this fall. It includes some ancillary costs plus uh, uh, paying for portions of the year for a number of, of uh, positions, including the secretary, the media specialist, so that the media specialist can get the uh, library put together, bookkeeper, and associated startup costs. Staff recommends approval. Okay, anyone rec I'd like to make a rec uh, motion for this, this one? Motion for Mr. Hall. Anyone like to second this? Second from Mr. Wimberly. We have the director's recommendation. Any other further comments or questions? Okay, I see none. Go ahead and record your votes then, please. Ms. Durham? I vote yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you. The next item is substitute teacher incentive bonus. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, over the course of this fall, I've had numerous conversations with some of our WCEA leadership, including leadership from each of the individual buildings. And one theme that they have given me over the course of this fall is staffing for substitute teachers. And we did some research and we're really looking to approach this, this shortage for substitute teachers in more ways than one. But this particular suggestion we've taken to the board to ask you to approve an incentive bonus for substitute teachers. Uh, and we, we discussed the details of that in the memo. Uh, and again, I wanted to emphasize this is one of many things that we're working on to try to increase our substitute uh, staffing. Generally speaking, our substitutes are staffing at about 80% of the need on a daily basis. Of course, it goes up and down just a little bit every day. But uh, staff recommends approval in the hope that this can move that just a little bit higher. Okay, who would like to make a motion on this? Okay, we have a we have a motion from Ms. Cleveland. I would like to second. We have a second from Ms. Emerson. Mr. Fiscus. Uh, yes, I was a college student many years ago and uh, knew that I was going to become a teacher, and so I uh, began substituting when I came home at Christmas break, and then uh, in May when I finished my semester. And um, and I can tell you that um, that the money that I was paid helped. Um, but the experience that I gained was the most important part of that. And so this is really more of an encouragement to the many college students that we know we have that are, um, have, have decided to become teachers to, to investigate how they can become substitute teachers as well. So when they're home, um, that they're, they're doing that, um, helping fill that need. Um, but I also would ask us over this next year to really consider how can we increase uh, our day rates for those uh, at those different levels. Uh, I, I, Candy and I had a great conversation at the at the comp convention uh, about uh, our passion for teaching, and, and it really is an, an important step for us to figure out how can we increase that day rate um, to honor those people who have have uh, are retired and may be giving back, or to those that are exploring uh, who could be come out as the grow your own uh, process that. Clarksville talked about that some of those folks um, 
uh, could come from, from some of our grow your own teachers could come out of those who are substituting now uh, with some more development and some opportunity for, for training, so. Thank you, Mr. Fiscus, for that. Uh, that is one of the long-term uh, discussions we need to have, especially in the context of next year's budget. This particular item uh, that's, on, that's on for your agenda tonight includes an additional bonus based on per pay period uh, days that a substitute works, but that's a well-made point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Emerson? Thank you. Um, Thursday at our work session, um, I had the opportunity to speak to um, the fees that substitute teachers are being paid. And um, I just think we are missing a very important opportunity here to tap into these veteran teachers that spent years in the classroom and understand so much about the education and in the way to give it and they're incredible teachers even if they come in for one day they have such an amazing effect on the kids that they are able to work with and that being said part of the problem i think that creates a lot of spaces for substitutes that are not filled is the fact that our qualified licensed certified teachers when they come back into the classroom really are not paid what they equitably need to be paid so we had quite a bit of discussion about this and uh, the board was very receptive and i'm very appreciative for their letting me uh, expound upon that because there are just lots of people that i know that love what they do but when they retire they go back to the classroom out of love but they can't really do it to afford uh, to make a difference in their income and to me, that's just shameful because they gave up many years and they worked very hard and they need to have pay that honors their service and also their, their degree. And I think, um, as I said, the board was very receptive. I think we've got uh, some work to do on this, but I want to, the, uh, the s s teachers that are out there that are retired to be encouraged and don't think that we're ignoring you. We are not. We're working on something that I think is gonna prove to be very beneficial for you and as a teacher myself I, I get it you know it's it's something that uh, needs to happen so thank you for listening to me and thanks for listening to me on Thursday and getting behind this I really appreciate it thank you mr. cash uh, thank you mr. chair I can't <laughs> uh, I can't say much more than uh, miss Emerson and mr. Fiscus said but I, I would just like to say this is a great start uh, mr. golden but you know, we've, we've talked about this probably every year for the last five or six years. And I just, I, I would just like to see it fulfilled and really a push to get these folks uh, a little bit more money because they're coming in because they're so dedicated to kids. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But, you know, it would be nice to show up on their paycheck a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wimberly? Uh, during the break at our meeting on Thursday night, our security officer asked perhaps one of the best questions uh, of the evening, uh, and that was, how many positions do we have that go unfilled on a typical day? And then the follow-up question would be, so when a uh, substitute position is not filled, what happens? I know you know the answer, Mr. Golden, because I... Well, yeah, so, so it's a number of things, and it's going to vary from school to school and day to day, but uh, it includes teachers filling in for those spots, uh, sometimes students getting moved to a teacher who, uh, who knows that student's needs and serving that, um, some teachers giving up their planning periods from time to time, uh, the library staff helping, school counselors helping, school administrators helping. It is all hands on deck in those in those settings and uh, as I understand it we have about 20 percent of the positions unfilled uh, each day and so these if we must call them disruptions um, are occurring with 20 percent of the substitutes and I forgot the number of how many subs we have on a typical day but it's a rather significant impact on the district with a 20 percent rate of 
vacancies for our subs. Well, from a from a total number of disruptions, I don't think you can count uh, the, the 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 total number. Um, from a from a staffing standpoint, generally speaking, our our absences, teacher absences, range from about 150 to 250 a day. So there is a pretty pretty wide gamut. Uh, um, I will say though, with all that being said, our teacher staffing, their attendance rate over the course of the year is in the is in the mid 90s. So this is not a teacher issue. This is a substitute issue. I felt like it was important to emphasize mm -hmm. that. Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. That's one example of, of the potential for absences right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't see any, anyone else who would like to ask a question or comment on this one. So we have a motion and a second. And we have the director's recommendation. If you'd like to record your votes now, please do so. And Ms. Durham? I vote yes. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you, board. Our next item is the uh, 2020 zoning proposal. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have spent the last month plus walking through our zoning proposal, having public meetings regarding that. Uh, and as you all know, the, this is largely to uh, create a zone for our new middle school that's being built on Henpeck Lane, but also to give relief to um, Spring Station Middle School with some impacts on the elementary schools as well. Uh, I, we've had a lot of good community input regarding this from a, from a number of folks, and, and, uh, and I mentioned this to someone as we were going through this. Uh, sometimes those meetings are hard, but I have never failed to appreciate the discussions that we've had with our families about about their, their children's experience in our schools and their request of you related to zoning. We make the recommendation and you all have the hard part of having to vote and make a decision. So with that, uh, with, this, with the study that we had and the meetings that we had with uh, our, our families, we do recommend you approve our proposal as proposed. Okay, but I would like to make a motion on the proposed rezoning plan. We have a motion from Mr. Wimberly, and we have a second from Ms. Garrett. Okay, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we suspend policy and allow the rising seventh graders for the 2020-2021 school year at Spring Station Middle, who are being rezoned to Heritage Middle or Thompson Station Middle to be allowed to remain at Spring Station Middle for the 2020-2021 year as well as the following year, 2021 and 2022. This, uh, the intent of this motion is to effectively grandfather the current sixth grade class at Spring Station Middle School, allowing them to finish their middle school career at Spring Station. Okay, I'd like to ask Ms. Osbrook, since this, he's asking for a uh, suspension of policy and a motion attached to it, do we need to vote on those separately or as one, one vote to say suspend policy for the? We can vote on it as one and as we just, as one motion, as we've discussed at the work session by um, suspending policy, if that is approved, then that policy would come in January to the policy committee. Okay, so we're looking for just one vote on this and we have a motion for Mr. Mitchell would anyone like to second that motion <clears throat> take one and okay. pass it down Mr. Hawes seconds the motion okay I saw Ms. Garrett's name up there as a second was that a carryover from the last one that's, that's from the it's the underlying motion. Oh, I got you. Okay, so this is, I'm sorry. So this is, this is for an amendment to that. I'm very sorry. This is an amendment to that motion. Then. All right, so anyone like to speak to the amendment that Mr. Mitchell has proposed? So we're only 
if I may. I'm talking about the amendment now. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So, so what I've handed out here real quick was a document that uh, was um, available to the public on, uh, I guess, uh, our Thompson Station meeting. Uh, what you see is the existing um, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. That's existing sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at the uh, at Spring Station Middle. There was, and so if, uh, from the uh, PowerPoint on page 17, it talks about moving uh, a total of 230 students from Spring Station. Current students is what it's talking about to uh, Heritage Middle and Thompson Station Middle. So the students that I'm talking about in this, in this uh, matrix are just the sixth graders. So there's 57 of them going to Heritage Middle and 24 going to Thompson Station Middle. So as we're, because this metric, this matrix shows current students. So the seventh graders in that matrix are already grandfathered. The eighth graders in that matrix are going to the high school the following year. So these are just the existing sixth graders. So I think you, the point of what I'm trying to show there is really the small number of students that are being moved out of their school. In particular, there's only 24 of them that are going to Thompson Station Middle. So you can figure that group of two dozen students are going to leave the 800 or so students that they know and go into a brand new school predominantly with students that they don't know and the 57 are doing the same so that's the that's the ones that I'm asking that they're allowed to stay at Spring Station assuming their parents provide transportation to it so we're not it's a one-year bubble uh, the second sheet would shows you what the that the following year at 2021 20, 22 the school is back under capacity so again it is just those 81 students that i'm looking to grandfather for one year the rising sixth graders would go as zoned and the uh, eighth graders already have a choice the rising eighth graders already have a choice of of staying if they'd like Thank you, Mr. Galbraith. Yes, I uh, just have a question on this uh, on this sheet. So it appears that the that the page, I guess it's page 20 on the PowerPoint that talks as far as the 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 rezoning plan and the attendance at current year, next year, and three to five years. So it showed a projected enrollment of 840 before this uh, grandfathering plan. But really, what it should show, is if we if we wanted to to compare just the impact of, of Mr. Elliott's um, amendment, would be it would be 840 plus the 73 seventh graders that are going to stay. So it really should be 913 um, if we want to compare apples to apples. So I agree. I so agree. the I those numbers were wrong too. well they're not they're not they're not wrong. It just it it's just the way that it's presented is before is before grandfathering um, on the, as far as, as it was presented on the PowerPoint to the, to the public. Um, and, I, and it was presented as such, it was presented that this does not include the grandfathering. But, um, so, but it's also, um, when you add, when you add the, the impact of the, six, of the rising sixth graders of 81, um, it does put us over, uh, right now we're, right now the, um, I'm trying to do a little bit of, of mental math, but it looks like um, about 980 something students over. Um, it it reduces that down to 28, but that's only if 100% of those students choose to stay. And um, and in the past, um, I don't know if we have a a good number, uh, Miss Nunley, about how many um, how many students typically stay. I, I've my my just swag is is around half and that's the that's the number that we usually use but is that can you do you have a number that's better than that uh, i'll invite uh miss dunley to oh, I'm answer sorry, I thought that, she was that, 
that that she's 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 sitting so she'll be able she can come to the podium to answer some detail um, we, we have some examples of, uh, of rezoning in the past. We actually pulled uh, the, uh, the, um, the rezoning for the new Thompson Station Middle School as it opened, and we had 38% of the total students, eighth graders, choose to, choose to grandfather, and that was about 85 or so students, if I remember right, right in that range. Uh, but that was a new school opening. Allison may have some information on, on rezoning with grandfathering. I will tell you, my guess, my educated guess, would be for rezoning an existing school to another existing school, the, the percentage would be higher than that 38, so you may be right. Mm -hmm. Ms. Nunley? What I was going to share with the board is what, what you did. Um, when Thompson Station Middle opened in 2018-19, about 38% of the students that were eligible to grandfather grandfathered. When Mill Creek Middle School opened in 2016-17, we only had four students that grandfathered and stayed at their current school, Sunset Middle. I did not, I apologize, review for when we did this past rezoning um, between middle schools, which was between Woodland Middle and Sunset Middle School, uh, but the board did allow rising seventh graders the option. Thank you. Um, so I guess that that being said, um, it's it's safe to say that it, it, it historically hasn't been 100%, and if it's anywhere in the um, below the 70 or 80% range, um, we, we will not have a capacity issue and, and we'll probably um, at, at capacity, we we should be able to um, to remove the the portables um, on a on on that on the schedule um, for next year, um, and so not incur any additional cost. And it seems to me um, the the state law that says that we should we should honor open zoning to the extent that we have capacity. Um, seems to dictate, um, and that's and that's really what I would like to um, to base a, a policy change around um, from from this standpoint would be that if, if in the case that we that we have open capacity at an existing school for our transition plan, not to modify the the zoning proposal, would be a, would be to set parameters that we would we would allow. Um, rising seventh graders and rising fourth graders to uh, to stay at their respective schools if if we if the board and the and the projections show that we would have additional capacity I think this meets the um, the criteria and therefore I think we should do this um, in order to um, to manage to, to manage one of our um, parameters which is to impact as few families as possible thank you Thank you. Ms. Nunley, did you have anything else on this particular question? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cash? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Every time a zoning comes up, we uh, obviously get a lot of emails. Um, a lot of parents are concerned for their kids, which we understand. But the bottom line is, is we've got to look at the big picture here. What? <laughs> And I'll, and I'll ask Mr. Golden, what effect will this have on the new middle school? Um, it's very important that we uh, fill that school as much as possible. And there's, there's several reasons for that. We can't, we can't ask the county commission to build a school and because of zoning issues, or people not wanting to move, or transportation issues, or anything like that, and uh, you know, for maybe curriculum issues or sports and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the education of the children are the most important thing. It's kind of hard for a board to send a superintendent to ask for a school if we're not willing to vote to backfill it. Now, this, this whole proposal, it sounds like a kind of a win-win, but it would be based, to me, it would be based on, is the new middle school gonna lose students 
because of this uh, amendment? This amendment alone, as, as, as articulated by Mr. Mitchell, does not address the new middle school. So my understanding of the way it was articulated is it will not have any impact on the new middle school uh, because our new middle school rezoning is to be pulled from portions of the Thompson Station and Heritage Middle School zones. Uh, so now, might it have an impact on, on you all as board members if someone who might uh, have wanted to grandfather into Thompson Station or Heritage to the new middle school? Perhaps, but this motion itself uh, does not have any impact directly on the school attendance at the new middle school. So with, with feedback from parents, uh, it seems like uh, all of Wingate and all those folks uh, say their children are walking to school, riding bikes. I know Cherry Grove folks can, uh, can actually walk. Um, so let's say there's a, a large percentage of students that grandfather in and that'll take numbers away from Thompson Station and Heritage. So is that going to take, is that going to leave Heritage way under? Or, I mean, it's not going to affect the new middle school whatsoever. That's right. Uh, absent a, an occasional out of zone based on a teacher or something like that. Um, but from, from our number, from a big number perspective, it would not affect the, the new middle school. Uh, it would reduce the number, obviously, of students who, are, who, are, who would be moving to Heritage and Thompson Station. Uh, both those schools have viable numbers. Uh, uh, Thompson Station still has room. Heritage uh, was closer to capacity prior to us opening uh, this, this, this new middle school on Henpeck Lane. Uh, so as I said at the work session, uh, this, it's not our recommendation to do this, but we could live with it. Uh, for, you know, it, it, I think Mr. Mitchell articulated it well. It is that, it is that one year bubble. Uh, from a planning perspective, uh, historically, we have liked uh, having having the policy uh, as is. Uh, to your point about the, the particular discussion, Mr. Galbraith, of uh, of reevaluating policy, I think there's some wisdom in that. No matter what the vote is uh, at this time, because this is the second or third time that there's been a pretty deep discussion about middle schools. Uh, so, I'm uh, long term, I'm I'm very much open to us discussing it. But but to your fundamental question. Uh, uh, those three schools, Spring Station, Heritage, and Thompson Station, will be viable for our ability to offer students the services uh, that we want to offer at the middle school uh, uh, in, 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 any event, in any way uh, based on this motion, whichever way it goes. Uh, we've recommended to go ahead and do the rezoning based on the policy because it gives a little bit more immediate relief to Spring Station. Mm -hmm. Now, will, will we, in fact, be able to remove uh, portables at Spring Station? Uh, we don't know for sure yet. Um, what we evaluate is kind of longer-term projections, along with a cost per month, of course, annually. Balance that against the cost to move portables. Uh, and we also talked a little bit about capacities and our obligation under the Tennessee law to uh, open zone if there is capacity. The reality is, from an operational standpoint from schools, max capacity is not optimum capacity. So when we make those recommendations, we usually base it on a, on a smaller number uh, to open zone. Uh, so the short answer to your question, and I'm struggling with giving short answers in a zoning setting, right, because it's so complex. Uh, short answer is we really don't know for sure right now. We're going to evaluate what, uh, what we get uh, in, the, in the way of new students plus folks who choose by May 15th uh, whether to grandfather in before we make a decision late spring on the portables. Okay, so open zoning comes up in January. Is it a possibility that uh, Thompson Station, Heritage, and uh, possibly Page be open zoned? Is that something you talk about tonight? or? Yeah, uh, it, it is a possibility. We, we uh, to your point, we talk about that in January. What we do after these decisions is go back, uh, look at our numbers, look at our projections, 
and uh, make recommendations after we spend December and, and uh, early part of January of, of projecting for next year. As I look at numbers today, I do think, uh, regardless of this, this decision, Thompson Station Middle is a potential candidate for open zoning for this year. Page Middle is a potential candidate for open zoning because we are opening up a wing uh, projected uh, during this school year. I can't speak to Heritage right now. I think that's going to be a must, much closer proposition. Definitely Henpeck, right? Uh, and Henpeck has the potential. The Henpeck, the new middle school has the potential for that as well. Thank you. Okay, um, you know, a lot of the comments from parents were, um, you know, leave the portables, the kids are happy. Um, i just like to say publicly, that's, that's not what we want to do in Williamson County Schools. Under any circumstances, that is a last resort. That's why we're building schools. They separate the kids, they separate the teachers. It's, it's just not right. Uh, another thing that comes up a lot is busing, and I just like to, once in a while, we need to throw out uh, some facts and figures. We have about roughly uh, 26,000 students that are transported in 234 zone, 200 bus, 234 bus routes in the morning and in the evening. That's 52,000 students that Williamson County Schools move safely and the majority of the time, they are on time. You know, people don't understand the statistics and what goes on to make this school system run sometimes. Zoning is a big issue because of staffing needs and everything else. And I, I just like to throw that out once in a while, just throw them figures out because 52,000 students a day they do a fantastic job. So anyhow, thank you, uh, Mr. Golden. Thank, thank you for that. I did want to emphasize the 230 plus routes that you talked about. Uh, those are the buses. And so we actually run a middle high and then an elementary as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's closer to twice that number for actual routes. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cash, for the question about the middle school. I think that's a good distinction that I thought came out of the work session is that we don't want to hold back the opportunities at a new school opening, and I think Mr. Mitchell's amendment makes a good, clear distinction on that, uh, and I think that it is in keeping with the parameters or the agreed upon uh, goals of impacting as few families as possible. So where there is capacity, and, and I appreciate your candor, Mr. Golden, on the actual impact that this would have, and, and it's, uh, it's a good level of trust to have that uh, that response so that we can factor that in because if 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 there was going to be an adverse impact and if we did think that this was going to result in portables and extra expense and some inconvenience at, at the expense of the students who remain at the school uh, that would not be something I support but in this case I think that um, we are making reasonable accommodations. One of the things that I just kind of want to put a pin in, though, is I do have some misgivings about exacerbating the transportation and traffic problems in Williamson County with this flexibility. Um, I don't know that it's a reason to not do this, but I do think that that's worth getting some feedback on and, and seeing what we're doing to contribute to that because uh, we want to encourage bus ridership as much as possible, and yet that runs contrary to uh, making some of these accommodations for grandfathering and open zoning. Um, I also want to say that Ms. Nunley's team did an awesome job of coming up with a great plan uh, and communicating it exceptionally well. I think that the meetings run really effectively, uh, even those that are affected seemingly adversely. Uh, have an opportunity to be heard and they always leave with really good information and a lot of credibility that we offer in an excellent process. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Garrett. I think Sheila was ahead of me. She did. She chose not to speak. Oh, sorry. Missed that. Uh, just three quick things. First of all, we are the policy making body for this district. So I have a concern about suspending policy. Um, 
I think that, you know, I, I think about this in other contexts. I think, what if a principal suspended policy and made a decision on their own? You know, I think that that policies and and the work that we do is very important. And I I don't think we should continue to get in the, to the realm of suspending policy. If we need to look at our policies, let's look at them outside of a rezoning, and let's reconsider our policies. Um, Additionally, you know, the, the issue of uh, trying to impact as few families as possible and offering some flexibility, I'm all for that. But I think that's already part of our process when we talk about the open zone slots and the open zone numbers each year in January. So I think that that is where we can make some accommodations. And that is probably where we should uh, in my mind, make the accommodations after we have a better sense of what the numbers are going to be. Uh, and then finally, you know, I have this this issue of if if it's something that we can't offer to all students and all families, then do we offer it to some? And I'm thinking of the families in the Henpeck area and Macklemore Farms who've been rezoned, who will have been rezoned twice. and you know, they're, they're not having this opportunity as well. So those are, those are my thoughts um, as policy chair. And again, I, I strongly recommend that we discuss this policy. We've got other rezonings coming up, but we discuss it outside of the context of an actual rezoning. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, I guess in closing, I'll, I'll uh, point out a couple of notes I had made that uh, based upon what Allison's uh, numbers were of 38, even when we do grandfather, only 38% take advantage of it, uh, and, and in one, some cases almost 100% do not, uh, I would reiterate the fact that giving that opportunity to this small number of children is not going to be particularly impactful uh, to the schools, to the source schools, the schools that they're coming from, because they will, the ones that want to go can go, the ones that don't want to go don't have to. And, and the numbers that, that were quoted to us earlier of 38% being the highest and four children being the lowest kind of goes to the fact that really uh, doing this for these few dozen children uh, is not going to not going to blow numbers anywhere. Um, if we're going to have room at Thompson Station Middle School to open zone it in January, then that offers that opportunity to the Henpeck Lane uh, families as well via the open zoning. But I don't see us open zoning spring station middle uh, coming January. So that's why this particular motion is specific to just spring station middle. Um, I had also had the thought that open zoning page middle could, could as well give opportunity of release of, re, of allowing the families out in the Arno Road area that currently go to spring station middle opportunities to go back to a closer school too. Um, Nancy, relative to suspending policy, that was guidance from council uh, on how to do the motion correctly. So, you know, that was the reason for that particular verbiage. Um, so so I'm, I'm making this motion because these are my constituents. If somebody wanted to do a similar motion for the their constituents within the uh, Henpeck Lane area, then that uh, that would be their, uh, I, I think, their privilege. But um, that since those aren't the folks that are in my district, that's why I didn't do that. And at the meeting that I went to at, uh, um, not Woodland, but uh, the, the elementary school on Henpeck. Oh, okay. Oakview, thank you, thank you. At the meeting at, at Oakview, I don't remember any of those parents asking to be grandfathered to stay at Thompson Station. And, and so they were all very excited about a school 
closer to their neighborhoods where they weren't going to have to drive south to get get their middle school students to a middle school. In fact, contrary, a lot of them were talking about their high schoolers that went to Centennial and their middle schoolers that went to Thompson Station and, and the fact that they were going to appreciate not having to go to two different schools in two completely different directions. Um, so again, I'll point out that in the sheet I handed you, there's only 24 sixth graders, 24 sixth graders that were wanting to move. So, so kind of think about it, if that was your sixth grader, uh, out of two, you know, only two dozen kids that you're, that you're moving from that, from their middle school, but they're gonna, th that would be your, your worry as well, I believe, given the small number of students that we've targeted in this move. So, anyway, that's my, that's my ask. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cash? Yeah, I, Mr. Chairman, I just, I'd like to answer Elliot's question. Um, you know, my zone is, it goes every which way, and this affects several different groups of people, but uh, this, this could work as long as Thompson Station has open zoning. And, uh, you know, that would take care of that. I, I do, like I said at the work session, this, this has been a, a real tough decision for me um, because I know how hard staff works. I, I've been at every staff meeting. I know how much time and effort goes into this. Uh, so, and I'd, and I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved, but uh, we'll just, we'll have to see what the vote brings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Well, I appreciate we all want to represent our districts. I, I want to remind all of us that we represent all Williamson County students, not just the ones from our, our area. And if we're going to go down this road of saying here is an exception for my district and my particular schools, and we're going to start setting this precedent again, then I would encourage everyone to sort of look at where that road is, is going. And so what we're leading to is making the argument that we're never going to rezone any rising sixth graders. And we've set that precedent and that parameter, and we've given a very legitimate argument for anyone who wants to make that. And if we're going to make that argument, then I'm going to say we're also making the argument for any rising freshman in high school, because I would make the argument that that is even more set in the ways that we're going with that. And so if we're doing that, what is that impact going to be for the entire district? And so if we're saying that our parameter is to impact the fewest number of families possible by negatively impacting our zoning countywide, we are negatively impacting every student in the county. And so to say it's just a few To say it's just a few, I, I, have to, I have to disagree because I think what we have to look at is, is both the immediate short-term implications, but what are the long-term implications that we're putting in place by, quite frankly, not following our policy with this. I have to guess, have to ask the question, Mr. Golden, if, if the narrative here is, is starting to become, you know, there's no impact at all to this, then why was the zoning recommendation made in the first place? Why are you recommending that we, we go along with it? Uh, I, I know that, you know, Allison and you and none of us enjoy moving kids, so I think there's a reason for it. And along with that, I, I think that you touched upon it, but I don't want to put words into your mouth where you kind of made the comment about there's a... Um, uh, a maximum and a, not ideal was the word, optimal, thank you, optimal uh, uh, capacity. Well, so obviously there is an impact and that's why we're making a recommendation. Uh, I, I wanna, I, we talked about 38% when Thompson Station Middle opened as being the number of eighth graders who chose to, chose to grandfather in. 
Uh, I think Mr. Galbraith was probably right when he suggested it was probably going to be more than that. And that's based on my experience of, of choosing not to go to a new school versus choosing to go to a school that already exists. I do think there's a difference there. Another peculiarity in this area is these three middle schools, Spring Station, Thompson Station, and Heritage are all within about three miles of each other. It is a very close zone. Uh, system down there for these for these middle schools so so car travel traffic of, of course is an issue but distance wise they're all they're all pretty close uh, and and so I anticipate based on my experience uh, that it will probably be a little bit more than 38 percent obviously I can't I can't anticipate that for sure another clarification I want to make sure that I that I point out is the, uh, all, the, all those the, all those roads with the Arno name, Bethesda Arno, those those zone, those school, those roads that we were discussing are in the Thompson Station middle zone. Generally speaking, uh, there's a little bit of Spring Station uh, that, that may be affected in that context, but um, uh, uh, th those folks in the rural districts years ago, I know, argued for the Page area. So I felt like it was important to emphasize that. From a capacity standpoint, one of the things that uh, we have learned over the years that every year gets emphasized just a little bit more is the stated architectural capacities of buildings are truly, truly maximum capacities. Uh, we've talked about response to intervention, RTI, tier three intervention, pullouts, uh, extra services that we're offering students as, as education evolves. Uh, and the, the old tradition that folks think of as us just sticking to a classroom just isn't happening at really at any level. Students are moving around the building. Uh, teachers are finding spots to teach. Students are fi uh, finding locations to interact. And so when we talk operationally, uh, for practical purposes, uh, we have for the last couple of years really been talking about 90% as kind of a max for us. Beyond that, it gets tough for a principal to manage their building. Now, that's a generalization. Every school is a little bit different. Some of the older schools with fewer spots to pull students are, are a little bit tougher than some of the brand new ones. Um, but that's, that's, I think that's my answer as best I can to your question uh, from an optimal perspective. Certainly, and following up on that then, um, speaking in very general terms, obviously every school and every scenario is different. But when we get to that maximum capacity, if you will, is there any uh, negative impact on our ability to offer services to those children in terms of cafeteria or restroom space or even um, access to uh, teachers, what, whatever it is? is? Is there any impact in general? Well, sure, it gets tougher. Of course, portables uh, create some logistical challenges. Uh, we've already talked about those. Uh, cafeteria space, if we're grossly overcrowded, that's going to affect the number of lunches, uh, and you end up having to push lunches earlier. Uh, so, so yeah, there are, there are a number of those impacts that really vary from, from school to school. That is in part why we're making this recommendation. And I will say also, as this policy has evolved over the 14 or so years I've been here, it's had different different permutations uh, and I recognize from a board perspective it's tough to balance uh, our need to plan and zone with being as accommodating uh, to families as we can. From my perspective as a superintendent uh, this policy has has worked well in its current incarnation uh, and and I like it and I respect it. I recognize that it's not perfect. I don't think that there's ever a possibility for this policy to be perfect even if we tweak it. Uh, because it is a human endeavor and there's so many complexities. Um, but because of all those reasons, uh, that's why we made this recommendation to you. Uh, again, Mr. Mitchell's 100% right. It creates that bubble for a year. Uh, that's just not our recommendation because we do have the opportunity to give Spring Station a little bit more space. And the sibling policy would still be in effect with this, would it not? Yes. Can you explain that real quick? The sibling policy allows uh, brothers and sisters, you know, folks living in the same in the same household, to grandfather in along with the rising student from the grade level as they've grandfathered. So traditionally, in this example, an eighth grade student who has a sixth grade, a rising eighth grader who has a rising sixth grade sibling, in other words, a current fifth grader, 
uh, could, uh, parents could have both those siblings continue, move, go on to that middle school. So that rising sixth grader from the fifth grade could go out of zone along with her older sibling and finish that school, finish that school route. Likewise, that, that sibling policy extends to younger siblings as well. In the middle school example, if they're two years apart, eighth grade to sixth grade, younger children from that same family could continue on. So in some of those, those examples where there are many, many children, we have had some, a handful of those examples, students could continue along through a school system for a number of years. Uh, so so uh, if you extend seventh grade, of course, that enables the, in this example, the rising fourth graders. Thank you. Or the rising fifth graders, current fourth. Mr. Wimberly. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to call the question. Okay, call the question. Um, I've been advised that we need a second and then we would need to vote on it. I'm sorry, did I hear a second? We have a second from Mr. Welch. Okay, is there any discussion or is it a straight vote? Straight vote. Straight can, vote. Can, so, so we need to do a hands or vote, just, voice vote. Just do voice. voice can vote. we go around? This is on calling the question. Calling the question only. Okay, so can you go around and call? Angela Durham. Ms. Durham, do you want uh, the... Yes. Okay. Jane Cash. Yes. Elliot Mitchell. No. Brad Fiscus. Yes. Gary Anderson. Yes. Jack Galbraith. Yes. Sheila Cleveland. Yes. Candy Emerson. Yes. Rick Wimberly. Yes. Eric Welch. Yes. Casey Hall. Yes. Nancy Garrett. Yes. Motion passed. Okay, the motion has passed to call the question, so then we are to vote on the amendment only, the amendment that we were just discussing. Can we have the amendment read to us again, please? Sure. I have, you want a copy of it? Rebecca, would you like a copy of it? Just to, um, so my policy as written was, or my motion was, I move that we suspend policy and allow the rising seventh graders for the 2020 and 2021 school year at Spring Station Middle, who are being rezoned to Heritage Middle School or Thompson Station Middle School, be allowed to remain at Spring Station Middle School for the 2020-2021 year and the following 2021-2022 school years. The intent of this motion is to effectively grandfather the current sixth graders at Spring Station Middle School to allow them to finish their middle school career at Spring Station Middle School. Okay, does so everyone understand the amendment? Okay, we have director's recommendation. I do not recommend approval. Okay, board members, if you go ahead and record your votes, please. Ms. Durham? I vote no. Your vote is four yes, eight no. Okay, the amendment has failed, so we're back on the original main motion. Would anyone like to speak to the original motion? Mr. Mitchell, was that? Anyone like to speak to the to the main motion? Okay, I see no one. Then superintendent's recommendation. Recommend approval. Okay, everyone, go ahead and record your votes. Ms. Durham. I vote yes. Your vote is eleven yes, one abstain. Oh, I'm sorry, one no. I'm sorry, eleven yes, one no. All right, thank you, board. The next item on our agenda is the five-year capital plan. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you all know from our work session, we presented our annual five-year capital plan. Wanted to point out a couple of generalities and then get into some specifics. Uh, from a generality uh, standpoint, the county commission requests this of us every year so that they can do some planning. They emphasize that this is actually not a funding approval by them once they review and make a decision on it, but it's an acknowledgement that these are our plans and these are the items that we expect to make funding requests of them over the course of time. On a more specific standpoint, 
you, you, you all see the uh, schools that we mentioned. I want to point out uh, as a point of clarification from the work session that we do have a north elementary school that we currently project for the fall of 2024. Uh, that is likely going to be in the northeast uh, portion of the county based on our projections at this point. Uh, we are also recommending a two-year schedule for uh, synthetic turf at our five remaining high schools, four of which, uh, four of our total nine schools with football fields already have that. And that schedule for completion would be fall of 2021 and fall of 2022. Okay, I would like to make a motion on the five-year capital plan as presented. Mr. Hall? And we have a second from Ms. Cleveland. Any further comments or questions, discussions? Mr. Galbraith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Golden, can, is, there a, is there a way to, um, to modify this? I know we talked, we talked a little bit um, about the North Elementary School, um, and I just want to discuss, see what the board thinks about the um, the merits of, of moving that forward. If we if we moved it forward a year, um, especially to get the to get the implementation design and the the land um, and show that that's that that's imminent. If we end up if we end up delay after after next year, we get the we get the design. We we find the land that we decide that we don't need it until a year later. That we can always push push off asking for the for the funds rather than moving it forward. In the um, given that that two million dollars is going to be in ne in in our ask for next fiscal year, I feel like that would be a better um, a better change, if you will. Um, if uh, assuming that everybody else agrees and that you would feel comfortable with our projections um, saying that that is a, a prudent decision. Uh, from my perspective, for the, for the coming year, I, I'd be fine either way. Uh, what we're really talking about is the Nolansville Sunset area. Uh, our projections uh, drove this document. Uh, but we recognize that there's a little bit of unpredictability, right, if, as, you, as you string out over the course of years. If that is moved, as I read this proposed plan from, from, uh, from me and our staff, um, our current intent to fund request for that particular item is 2022-23. Uh, if we moved it up, the intent to fund would be 2021-22. Uh, we are currently in the 1920 school year, so I will say for practical purposes, uh, I, I'm comfortable explaining to the county commission either way that uh, that is a volatile area when it comes to growth, uh, and and uh, and it, you know right now it's projected at two years out. Next year it could be one year out, and uh, and that that this is that the what they can really expect in this first coming year uh, are the items that are the intent to funds in 2020, 21. So I, I tell that to tell you. For me, operationally, in my relationship and communications with the county commission, I don't know that that'd make a difference one way or the other because I want to make sure I articulate that. So I guess the, the difference will, for me, the difference is going to be the, the, only, the only line item that the, the, the commission seems to care the most, well, the one that they care the most about, obviously, is the, is the current one. Um, and then what, what seems to frustrate them what would frustrate me as a commissioner would be every time i every time i get to the current year you're bringing stuff from future years forward into the current year rather than letting me see it two years out i, I don't care what happens in year three through five every time it's just what happens in year one and year two i can see that 108 million coming coming down the pike next year and if i all of a sudden make it 110 or 130 then I don't, not that I used it necessarily to plan with to begin with, but it, it just feels like you're, you're always kind of pushing stuff. And they're already going to get a little bit of that for us with the, with the turf, which came from off the plan. And then but, uh, we have a good, good story to tell and a good reason for that. Um, I just, to the extent that we, that it doesn't make a difference. Just wanted to see what everybody said. I, it doesn't, at the end of the day, I, I agree that it doesn't matter. Um, or I just think it would, 
it would be better presented to me um, because I think one I would like to I would like to hasten the the need to find land there yeah. because I thought we should have already been doing that yeah. um, and I and so and I also want to use this time to to um, to say we need everything that's on years one through three we we should have uh, I hope that we have identified properties that are um, that are possible and and start the vetting of those properties and to the extent that we need to to take um, action on um, on properties that are for sale I'm not taking I'm not talking about going and taking somebody's property adversely but if there's a if there's a property for sale and it meets the standards and it tests um, meets the tests then then I think we need to take action swiftly and quickly so that we can get these things because I've I've said it a couple of times but but the the fact that we've got that we're still asking for all this land money um, and I know it's up it, we keep the Commission doesn't like to see it up there up front every year but but the fact that we haven't bought the land is on us because we still haven't used all the all the money that they gave us three years ago to to purchase land so we need to um and i would like to see us be acquiring properties and pushing the county if if we run out of land money then we need then we can we can then go ask them for more but until then <laughs> the 36 million dollars that we've that we've got to um to purchase land in the next two years um, I don't think we're going to need. I think it's inflating the um, the number that we're um, that we're asking of the commission. So that's a good point. Uh, th we are behind, in my opinion, on land purchasing as well. Uh, there are, there are a number of reasons for that, but the reality is that it's getting more and more difficult. Uh, and uh, there, the I kind of categorize land um, into three basic areas, and that's an oversimplification: oversimpl land where somebody's living on it. Uh, land that's for sale and land that's being held for for uh, development or purchased by someone who's not living on it and I really do analyze it in those three contexts and uh, I sure want to avoid taking somebody's land if they're living on it uh, but the the the, uh, the other two basic categories are are typically the, the pieces of land that we make an attempt on first based upon the zoning and where we think a, a, an appropriate location is thank you uh, mr. Wimblad I, it doesn't record my thing, so can I jump and speak to this issue before you? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, one of the things we've noticed in the area that Jay was just talking about is we need to move as quickly as we can on purchasing the property mm -hmm. because developers, once they know where a school is going, they start the developments, and that will help us on our zoning and our planning in the future if we know where that p school is going to go. It would really help us because we got caught blindsided a lot on this and my being in the community I hear that there's a lot of potential developers waiting to move so I would I would ask that we consider moving it further up into the into the plan if at all possible on the purchase of the land because you got you're not purchasing the land here until 2023 is when you're asking to purchase the land there I think you're, you're really pushing it out because you've got the 2000 I'm assuming that's for development stuff and architect stuff the two million I'm talking about the north the north elementary school now yes. Fortney so that you wouldn't actually purchase the land until 2023 so you're talking three plus years down the road right now yep. and that concerns me because that is as you know a very dynamic growth with additional sewer lines gas lines and everything coming into that area right now yep. okay thank you mr. Wimberley mr. chairman as a point of order if you or Mr. Galbraith want to change this uh, or have discussion on it, shouldn't we have a motion to amend it? Uh, we can't. Uh, you can't. I, want, yes, I, just can. Wanted, I wanted to hear what the board said. I wasn't, for, I wasn't asking for an amendment at the time. I just wanted to hear what the other discussion was. I don't know if that's, if that's out of order, then. But there's, there's nothing before the, the board to consider Agreed. other than the original motion. Agreed. think do you think then that if it, in my mind it's a fluid document it changes constantly I wasn't as worried 
about a motion at this point, but for consideration, since it's three years down the road, it can be moved up at any at any point. I wasn't worried about a motion at this point. I was I was wanting to make sure that the administration knew that hey, we we need to be looking at this. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Galbraith, were you considering a motion at this time? I mean, only if only if Mr. Only if Mr. Golden was um, was in favor of one. It, it's not a. I don't. I wasn't pushing for or asking for a motion. I'm open to that, and I would not argue against it. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to make this clear to the county commission, and I will tell you this discussion is valuable because I'm going to share this with the commission when I speak to them. That that we as a board recognize that uh, that 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 this is fluid, and especially in the Nolensville area. And I'm going to I'm going to add Spring Hill to that as well. Uh, that those areas are are growing very fast. Okay, Miss Miss Emerson. Thank you. I agree. Uh, I think we've lost some valuable time already. I really do. And properties that we decide we are interested in, by the time we get there, they're already gone. And when you're talking about the Nolansville area, it is exponentially expanding. It's just huge. And, and we've got needs that are going to come up down there that we're not going to be able to address the way we would like to if we don't get on it and, and make some decisions and go ahead and purchase some land. Um, I know we're also talking about some other areas of the county and again you know when the word is out that you're looking it changes what people expect from the land and I think we need to to get what we can at the rate that is best for the school board and the county commissioners and we need to be proactive and not wait until we're reacting to a situation that we let get away from us Thank you. Mr. Chair, do you mind if I respond a little bit to that as sure. well? Um, especially since reporters are here, I want to emphasize this. We pay market value, and we actually have appraisals done of, for these lands that, uh, that we evaluate and determine can actually support a school building, and that is highest and best use. And so if the area is developable, uh, generally speaking, based on the professional appraiser's work, it's, it's, the value is probably more than something that is not subject to, to development. And so for those property owners out there who know that growth is coming, just know that we do pay that market value based on professional appraisals. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments, questions, discussions on the five-year plan? Okay, we have the director's recommendation then. If you go ahead and record your votes, please. Ms. Durham? I vote yes. Thank you. Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Thank you, board. Our next item is board policies, first reading, policy 1.403 on agendas. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a uh, proposed uh, change to the policy coming from the policy committee, and it actually articulates a portion of the state law regarding public comment. Uh, and so based upon that, I recommend approval. I would like to make a motion for this one. We have a motion from Mr. Mitchell. We have a second from Mr. Cash. Any further discussion? Okay, I see none. We have the superintendent's recommendation. If you'd go ahead and record your votes then, please. And Ms. Durham? I vote yes. We have a yes. Tim? Your vote is 12 yes, zero no. Okay, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving holiday season. Remember, we don't have any scheduled board meetings for December. No woof woof, nothing about that announcement. Uh, so I hope everyone has a very good holiday season, and we will see you at the beginning of the new year. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.